my name is Valerie Hagstrom, and I am the uh, coordinator of Global Women's Studies here on campus. And I am really pleased to welcome Dr. Lewis Wall, um, who is a professor emeritus from Washington University in St. Louis, and the Selena Okin Kim Connor Professor in Arts and Sciences for Medical Anthropology. Um, I need to mention to you that this event is co-sponsored by Religious Education and the College of Nursing, and we are grateful for their um, participation in this event. I also need to remind the colloquium students to please upload your questions that you're writing um, to Learning Suite in the, at, be, at the end of class today. Um, and then also remember that the first draft of your response papers is due tomorrow before midnight. I have just a couple of quick announcements. One is that the Global Women's Studies Honor Society is going to celebrate its kickoff social from 2 to 4 p.m. this afternoon, and they're hoping to do it in the Marigold Plaza, just, just directly east of this building. Um, and if it thunderstorms, mm, they will have a backup plan. Um, and there's going to be meeting and eating and completing all kinds of fun activities at that social. Uh, ne our next colloquium lecture will be two weeks from today in this classroom and by Zoom. Um, Dr. Rob McFarland will be talking about Thelma and Louise, the, that film at 30, Women Driving Hollywood and the Winding Route of the Classic Road Movie. So as is customary here at BYU, um, Anna Hughes, will be, uh, who is a Global Women's Studies minor and a psychology major, will be offering our opening prayer. Following the prayer, um, Alyssa Oman will introduce our speaker, and following our speaker, Emmeline Uluavi will be um, giving a short response to the presentation. The Q&A will be run by Tristan McAfee. And if you're listening on uh, Zoom, please uh, ask questions in the chat. And Chloe Vickers will help ask those questions. So we'll start with the prayer by Anna. Dr. L. Lewis Wall has had an outstanding career as a professor at Washington University of St. Louis and in his work as an obstetrician and gynecologist. He graduated from the University of Kansas with a BA in anthropology and history. He then earned a doctorate degree in anthropology from Oxford University. His work as an archeologist took him to Africa where he realized the people there, especially the women, needed medical care and doctors more than they needed anthropologists. He decided to attend medical school at the University of Kansas, where he graduated with his MD and completed his residency program in obstetrics and gynecology at Duke University Medical Center. Later, he attended Monash University in Australia and earned a master's degree in bioethics. Dr. Wallace had many publications and awards throughout his career. His book, Tears for My Sisters, The Tragedy of Obstetric Fistula, was published by Johns Hopkins University Press in 2018 and correlates with the material he is presenting today. Out of all his accomplishments throughout his career, he is most proud of his efforts to build three specialist hospitals for women in sub-Saharan Africa. He also developed a training program for the specialist care of women during child oh, of childbirth injuries at an Ethiopian university. His hobbies include listening to music, particularly jazz, reading almost too many books, and traveling as often as he can. He hopes his words will inspire us to look beyond our everyday lives and notice the bigger issues facing women around the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Wall to our colloquium. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. <clears throat> My talk today is entitled Biology, Destiny, and Women's Health, <clears throat> The Challenge of Obstructed Labor for the World's Poor Women. Okay. We're not advancing here. So to give you a pressy of the, the talk you're about to hear, next. It's difficult to be a poor woman in a poor country. Next. So biology is destiny. That's a pretty controversial statement. 
If you go back to the Hebrew mythology in Genesis, it proclaims that women's destiny is determined by their biology. Now that's not a literal historical fact, rather it's a description of the reality that was observed by the ancient Hebrews and their attempt to explain what they saw. Women's reproductive role was explained by them as part of the fall of mankind, which was tied in with disobedience to God and the subordination of women to men. <clears throat> to be the woman, to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall deliver children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. <clears throat> That's what you find in Genesis. And the sad fact of the matter is, <clears throat> biology is destiny for most of the world's women. They are expected to be wives and mothers above everything else. They generally get limited education. Their life choices are constrained by their societies. They often have limited choices in marriage, including when they get married and with whom. They have a limited say often in when or even if they become pregnant. They have little control over the allocation of society's resources, particularly with regard to the structure of healthcare systems. And when they're pregnant, they often have limited access to high quality bioscientific healthcare. Next. This is seen in the statistics related to maternal mortality and morbidity. <clears throat> the medical definition of a maternal death is the death of a woman while pregnant during delivery or within 42 days of the termination of pregnancy. <clears throat> maternal morbidity refers to non-fatal maternal illness or injury occurring as the result of pregnancy, childbirth, or associated <clears throat> complications. Next. This is a graph of worldwide maternal deaths by income. And if you look at the very top of this graph, there's a little tiny green line. And that little green line refers to the maternal deaths occurring around the world in high income countries like the United States or Canada or Norway or Sweden. <clears throat> Less than 1% of the world's maternal deaths occur in high income countries, <clears throat> which means that 99% of maternal deaths and the vast majority of serious childbirth injuries are occurring in poorer parts of the world. To look at this a little more broadly at the lifetime risk of maternal death, that's the risk if you're dying from a pregnancy related cause. <clears throat> that's a function of the, the risk of your dying in any given pregnancy, <clears throat> excuse me, and the number of times that you're pregnant over your reproductive life course. It also is directly related to your access to emergency obstetric care. In the United States, a woman at the age of 15 has a lifetime risk of dying in childbirth of about one in 3,000. It's pretty rare, it's pretty uncommon. In the worst parts of the world, where pregnancies are common, obstetric care is poor, the lifetime risk of a woman dying from a pregnancy complication may be as high as one in six. Now this map <clears throat> shows you where these problems are most acute. The darker shaded countries are the countries that have the higher risk <clears throat> of maternal death and serious childbirth injury. <clears throat> It's largely a problem for the bottom billion of the world's population, the poorest of the poor. Now, it was the same way in this country in the 19th century. <clears throat> and at the beginning of the 20th century, a woman's lifetime risk of dying or being seriously injured in childbirth was very similar to what happened currently happens in so-called third world countries today. But over uh, an abrupt period of time, particularly between 1935 and 1950, 
maternal mortality and childbirth injury plummeted dramatically all across the Western world to levels so low they'd never been seen anywhere in the world previously in recorded history. Why did that happen? We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So I wanna to explain to you what obstructed labor is and give you some of the biological background because it is intimately related to the physiology of childbirth and what can go wrong through no fault of the woman who's involved. Parturition is the fancy pants term we use in medicine for the act of bringing forth young. It involves the expulsion of the fetus that's developed in the uterus from the maternal pelvis during the process of childbirth. And it's neither a simple nor a straightforward process in humans. If you don't understand that, take your mother aside and just ask her <clears throat> what it was like when you came into the world. <clears throat> now there, from a biological point of view, there are competing evolutionary pressures that have influenced the nature of human childbirth. The first one is bipedalism. We walk about on two limbs in an upright position. That requires re-engineering the structure of the pelvis to allow for balance, mobility, and walking. <clears throat> and that involves architectural changes in the structure of the pelvis that make the pelvis a little more complicated in humans. The other complicating factor is something called encephalization. Over the course of human evolution, we have had bigger babies with bigger brains and bigger heads <clears throat> that now have to navigate a more complicated route through a pelvis whose architecture has changed. <clears throat> So the first problem is that walking around on two legs alters pelvic anatomy in ways that are disadvantageous from an obstetrical point of view. <clears throat> the human pelvis is shaped more like an hourglass than a cylinder, and that requires certain adjustments in the birth process. Our closest biological relatives, bonobos and chimpanzees, <clears throat> who have 99% the same DNA as humans, have a different pelvic configuration. Uh, we walk upright on two limbs. Chimpanzees and bonobos are knuckle walkers. They walk semi-upright. They can occasionally assume a full upright position, but in general, they walk on four limbs and they haven't had to change the pelvis as a result. <clears throat> So the chimpanzee pelvis is an hourglass, which means it's pretty much a straight shot from top to bottom, from inlet to outlet. Whereas the human pelvis has three different planes, an inlet, a mid pelvis, and an outlet. They're all of different size, shapes, and configurations, and the planes are all at different angles. The second problem that I've alluded to is increasing brain size over the course of our evolutionary history. What this means is in relatives like our chimpanzees, birth is a straight drop through the pelvis for the fetus during childbirth. But because of the altered pelvic plane and the large size of the fetal head and body, we have had to develop what's called rotational birth mechanics. The fetal head constantly has to change its position as it navigates the birth canal to get from the uterus through the vagina and out the pelvis. <clears throat> so the human obstetrical dilemma, as anthropologist Sherwin Washburn called it, comes from the combination of constricted pelvic anatomy due to our upright posture, increasing fetal head size, which means it's a really tight fit. <clears throat> Sometimes the baby won't fit through the pelvis, and that's when labor is obstructed. And just to give you a, a sense of this, here's a slide that shows 
the fit of the fetus through the maternal pelvis in various species. <clears throat> On the left, bottom left, you have the size of the fetal head related to an orangutan pelvis, a chimpanzee pelvis, a gorilla pelvis, and on the far right, you see how tight the fit is for a human fetal head getting through a human female pelvis. So on the left, you have an 18th century anatomical illustration of the tight fit of the fetus through the birth canal. And on the right, you have the complex eight-step process of the fetal head rotating as it descends and navigates the bony architecture of the maternal pelvis. Engagement, descent, flexion, internal rotation, extension, external rotation, and expulsion. And there'll be a quiz on this at the end of the lecture. <clears throat> Obstructed labor. It's failure of this process to progress. It's failure of labor to progress despite adequate uterine contractions because there's a mechanical obstruction to that process being completed in the birth canal as a woman in labor tries to deliver her child. It's a pelvic impasse. <clears throat> and if you look closely at this 18th century anatomical drawing, you can see that the fetus in the left is never going to make it through the bony pelvis. <clears throat> The distance between the sacrum and the pubic bone is new, too narrow to allow the head to advance. You can see the fetal skull bones overlapping as it's trying to narrow itself to get through the obstruction, and it won't make it. So what happens? Here you have the, an irresistible force coming up against an immovable object. Now you can ask your mothers this too, but labor is involuntary. Once it starts, the biology is programmed to expel the fetus. You can't say, oh, this is too difficult. Let's just put labor on hold here and come back at uh, 1245 when I've had a chance to rest. <clears throat> the uterus is going to contract until it completes its mission. But in a case like this, the fetal head is immovable. It will not fit through the pelvis. So what happens in that sort of circumstances? Well, when we run up against that in the United States and other developed countries, we perform vaginal bypass surgery, <clears throat> a cesarean section. When the vaginal route can't be accomplished, we create another passage, another exit point for the fetus from the maternal abdomen. We make an incision through the abdomen into the uterus and we extract the fetus surgically in the course of an operation. And this is, a, this is the most common major operation performed in the United States, cesarean section. We take it for granted, it is so commonplace. <clears throat> Over 30% of deliveries in the US occur by cesarean section. Raise your hand if you were born by C-section. You probably know. Oh. <clears throat> Mormon women, big pelvis, lots of babies, I can see. <clears throat> In poor countries, cesarean section is largely unavailable. The healthcare system and the medical technology to deliver it doesn't exist. In West Africa, it's been estimated that the overall cesarean section delivery rate is about 1.2%, which is certainly far below what's needed to meet the healthcare needs of pregnant women. So what happens if you have obstructed labor and because of where you live and your economic and social resources, you can't get a cesarean delivery for obstructed labor? Well, there's a cascade of injuries that occurs in this case. <clears throat> Labor becomes obstructed. There's not enough space for the baby to get through the birth canal. The fetal head descends as far as it can through that mechanism of labor. Then it becomes impacted in the maternal pelvis. It can't get any farther. So it gets squeezed tighter and tighter against the pelvic bones which are covered by various tissues. And as a result, 
The vaginal tissues of the bladder, the vagina, and the cervix are trapped between the fetal head and the pelvic bones and squeezed ever more tightly. As that pressure increases on those soft tissues, <clears throat> blood flow is compromised, then it's occluded completely. Because of the configuration of the pelvic anatomy, this pressure often occludes the bladder, neck, and urethra so that urination cannot take place, even though the bladder begins to continually fill with urine throughout this process. <clears throat> Eventually, the tissues that are compressed lose their blood supply, they die from asphyxia, and they eventually die. <clears throat> and as that tissue sloughs away, it can create a hole between the bladder and the vagina or other tissue injuries. And as you might imagine, this process, which can go on for three days, four days, five days, even a week, <clears throat> leads to a very high rate of fetal death. They simply cannot survive the trauma of the birth. <clears throat> so here's a picture that sort of shows you what's going on here. You can see that the fetal head cannot pass the available space in the pelvis. It's compressing the tissues of the bladder here. The bladder is filling continuously. It's getting distended. And it's in this area right here that the tissues are gonna be compromised and eventually they're gonna lose their blood supply and die. This condition when these tissues between the bladder and the vagina die goes by the medical term of vesicovaginal fistula. It's an abnormal hole communication between the bladder and the vagina. And it results in continuous urinary leakage. If you wanna think of your bladder as a bucket that receives urine from the kidneys, your bucket now has a hole in it. It continues to fill continuously with urine, but it always runs out because of the defect in the bladder wall. We see these injuries in the United States and other developed countries occasionally. Usually they're due to malignancy, to radiation therapy, or in most cases, they're due to surgical misadventure, an accident during a surgical operation, most commonly a, a hysterectomy. Throughout the rest of the world, particularly for the world's poor women, the cause of fistulas is pressure necrosis of the vesicovaginal septum from prolonged obstructed labor when there are no opportunities to deliver. And here's an example of a fistula. <clears throat> this is a metal probe that's been inserted through the urethra and you can see it's inside the bladder and most of the bladder in fact is now gone. The tissues die, they slough away a few days after delivery, and the woman is then left with this gaping hole that's supposed to contain urine. <clears throat> now, this is not just something that started to happen recently. There's a famous paper in the British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology by Professor Derry, looking at mummified <laughs> remains from the 11th dynasty of Egypt about 2000 years ago, and one of those was the mummy of Queen Hinhenet from the 11th dynasty. And she has a huge hole, a fistula between her bladder and vagina, the earliest known example of this injury. But clearly this has been going on for tens if not hundreds of thousands of years. The injuries that occur are not limited to the bladder. You can compress a wide swath of these tissues. And as a result, you can get injuries to the urinary system, to the gynecologic system. The cervix sometimes is absent. There's frequently severe vaginal scarring. You can get injury to the nerves that innervate the lower extremities, injuries to the muscles of the pelvic floor, to the anus, rectum, and perineum the constant discharge of urine 24 hours a day, seven days a week, leads to excoriation and injury and infection of the skin. And there's a high rate of fetal death 
And the end result is that women who sustain these injuries are often ostracized socially. They cannot fulfill their function as wives and mothers. They're unpleasant to be around because they're always wet. They frequently smell bad. They get everything soiled and eventually they get pushed to the margins of society. Here's a fistula from a young woman in Ethiopia. These tubes are in the ureters, which bring the urine down from the kidney. And you can see that when the kidney makes urine, it's going to deposit that urine directly into the vagina and the outside world. Here's a woman who's lost her entire urethra from this process. And as a result, the bladder will not hold in a urine because the stopper is broken. This is not a baby's head being born. This is actually a bladder that's turned itself inside out through a large injury of this kind. And you have the inner lining of the bladder now completely outside the woman's body. And it's extremely painful and difficult, if not impossible to live with. This is a photograph of a 14 year old girl in Ethiopia who had an injury of this kind. And I want to just draw your attention to two things. The first thing is this trail of urine that follows her wherever she goes because she cannot contain any of it. And the second thing is this stick. <clears throat> the nerves to her right lower extremity were injured during childbirth so she can no longer lift her foot up to walk and so she has to walk with a stick to push the right side of her body up and along as she goes while trailing this stream of urine with her everywhere she goes. Anthropologists and social scientists talk about a concept known as structural violence. <clears throat> and that's simply a way of a shorthand way of referring to the increased rates of death and disability that are suffered by those on the bottom rungs of society, as contrasted with the relatively lower rates of death and injury that are experienced by those who are economically more fortunate in the social system. <clears throat> those excess deaths, or at least a large, demonstrably large proportion of them, are a function of class structure, which is a product of society's collective human choices concerning how to distribute social goods and services among the other members of society. So this is tied directly to women's reproductive health. Females are the child bearers of humanity. And that means that they are the ones who bear the health consequences of reproduction. I will die someday. I'm supposed to be, a, oh. <clears throat> but I will never be a maternal death because I will never be pregnant and suffer the consequences of reproductive catastrophe. We know from years of research <clears throat> that social factors have a huge impact on reproductive health and pregnancy outcomes. <clears throat> These women who are trapped in this problem of obstructed labor and suffer these cat catastrophic consequences are innocent victims. There is nothing they did to bring this about. This was not the result of poor life choices or bad habits. They simply developed a faulty problem with obstetrical mechanics and lived in a part of the world where there was no resource available to overcome that. <clears throat> Many of the differentials in health status between males and females are a direct reflection of gendered structural violence. And a lot of these have to do with the way resources have been allocated with respect to women's health care, particularly in poor countries of the world. So how would you prevent these injuries from occurring? Well, the first thing would be to detect obstructed labor when it occurs early before it's gone on for two or three days. 
And that requires that labors be monitored by a skilled birth attendant who can make that diagnosis. And then you need prompt intervention to prevent prolonged labor. <clears throat> that means the person who is attending the birth needs to be able to call into play other resources to transfer patients to higher levels of obstetric care. It means improved access to interventional obstetrics, including but not limited to by any means cesarean delivery. The threshold for an injury of this kind occurring varies greatly from case to case, depending on a whole host of intervening factors. There is no minimum cutoff time for this occurring. So when labor becomes obstructed, intervention needs to occur as soon as possible thereafter. Now I mentioned the differential rates of cesarean section in West Africa in the United States. And this is from a paper in The Lancet by Cindy Stanton a few years ago that looked at rates of C-section, rates of cesarean delivery by wealth quintile in countries with cesarean section rates of less than 2%. <clears throat> now remember, 2% is a really inadequate level of cesarean delivery from obstetric indications. So this is countries at the bottom of the world in terms of obstetric services. And what they've done is they've broken out the cesarean delivery rates by the poorest up to the wealthiest quintile of society. And guess what? It's the wealthiest 20% that get the cesarean deliveries in countries like Haiti and Madagascar and other parts of the world. Similarly, if you take cesarean delivery rates from 42 low-income countries and break them out according to women who live in urban areas, have better access, <clears throat> the rural poor here in yellow have a very poor access, and the wealthy people in rural areas do substantially better than the poor. Okay, this is all very interesting, you may say, I hope you say. <laughs> Why is it important? Well, for one thing, obstetric fistula is a disorder that affects women exclusively. Fistula prevalence in a particular society is really often a direct marker for the social status of women in those societies. There's a reason why there are enormous numbers of obstetric vesicovaginal fistulas in Uganda and Nigeria and not in Sweden and Norway. <clears throat> it's an important human rights issue. Women, as I've said, are the exclusive bearers of reproductive morbidity and mortality. <clears throat> and as a right of matter of basic social justice, all women have a right to safe delivery and effectively emergency obstetric care. We owe that to the child bearers of our species. So let me come back to the question I asked near at the beginning of this talk. Why did maternal mortality fall so dramatically across the Western world in the first third, the middle third of the 20th century? It was a whole constellation of things that came together over the same time period. The professionalization of maternity care and the rise of obstetrics as a profession, the development of antibiotics to treat infections, blood transfusion, drugs that could control uterine contractility, antihypertensive and anti-seizure medications, the development of anesthesia and improved surgical techniques, which includes safe techniques for abortion care, effective contraception, integrated health systems management, and all of this was tied together by a commitment to provide near universal access to high quality obstetric care. And once those technologies were in place all across the developed world, maternal mortality fell to world historic lows. So I leave you with this thought. 
man comes in to see his doctor. I've been getting annoying pangs of conscience, doc, when faced with ethical dilemmas. Got anything for that? And I'll leave you with that thought as we have a discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wall. Um, I've been able to see a lot of your work the last couple of days as I've been preparing for this response and you have my respects. Um, in response to Dr. L. Lewis Wall's research on women's reproductive health, dealing specifically with maternal mortality due to complications such as fistulas caused by obstructed labor has encouraged us to rethink the women's experience and the hardships that they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Based on Dr. Wall's article, global burden of disease study suggests obstructed labor affects at least 7 million women every year. 6.5 million of women live in the least developed regions of the world where access to competent obstetric care is poorest and the likelihood of serious complications is greatest. Dr. Wall's research matters because it focuses on on the life of a woman, and more importantly, the disadvantaged black and brown women. Being in the global women's studies class, global is emphasized because it ensures we are learning about women from all backgrounds. And that is exactly what Dr. Wall is doing. He ensures we see the perspectives of these women from Ethiopia, Ethiopia Niger, et cetera, so that we can hopefully apply it in our own surroundings or future careers. There is a wide understanding that the women's biology is what defines her. Even in the Christian belief, there is a label that women are to only have one purpose, and that is to have children. Some may have differing opinions, but what this label has to say is that women are okay to die as long as they are bringing life into this world. This is why we need to pay attention to the fact that women's lives are in danger and in need of ma major reconsideration. To wrap this up, obstructed labor is endangering the mother and the child. In most cases, there's a risk in losing both. So prioritizing the woman is prioritizing life. We must make an effect to be kind and understanding when it comes to the woman's experience, not because they are incapable, but because they are. Thank you. Okay. okay, so I'm going to start the Q&A. Um, Dr. Wall, what can we do in our limited sphere of influence to give women access to better maternal health care, particularly in order to give them aid in cases of obstructive labor? The solution to all problems begins with an awareness that the problem exists. <clears throat> so bringing that to the attention of your community, uh, particularly your political community, your state legislature, health departments, and so on, and putting it on the healthcare agenda for the community is important. <clears throat> uh, you never know who you talk to, where the seed will fall that will bear good fruit. <clears throat> Maternal mortality is still a problem in the United States, uh, although levels of maternal death and disability in this country are far lower than they are in Nigeria or Uganda or those parts of the world. We do not come off very well compared to our peer countries. <clears throat> uh, we're about 30th in the world in terms of maternal mortality. Slovenia does a better job than the United States and Cuba does a better job than the state of Louisiana. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it needs to be a priority. Uh, and I think frankly, one of the most important things that we could do in the United States to improve this is to provide universal access to obstetric care through Medicaid expansion to all women falling into that category. As long as you have pockets where people cannot access high quality obstetric care when they have an emergency, you're gonna have death and disability. Some of the other reasons that occur in the United States have to do with uh, racial and ethnic disparities and rates of maternal mortality. Those are complex. Often they're the pro 
uh, the result of, of centuries of oppression and social systems that deny resources to marginalized community. Some of, some of them are due to particular uh, healthcare problems that cluster in lower economic, uh, socioeconomic groups as well. We have an epidemic of obesity in the United States. And, and I'm part of that epidemic if you look at my BMI but that doesn't impact my uh, risk of maternal mortality. A lot of the young women of color who die in the United States have uncontrolled hypertension and heart disease as a result of, of their life circumstances, and that predisposes them uh, to worse outcomes. <clears throat> so the first thing you can do is raise a racket. The second thing you can do is advocate for more resources to go into these problems and to promote social policies that level out the inequities of access that occur for lots of these conditions. Not that I have an opinion. I have a question. You can come up to for police and to fix equality of women suffered. Yes, uh, these injuries can usually be prepared, repaired with the appropriate access to surgical technology. In poor countries, this is a conundrum. The injuries are occurring in large part because adequate surgical services are not available in the first place in the form of cesarean delivery. And so if you suffer this complication, you have uh, a very difficult time uh, getting care. Now, there's been an effort that's increased over the last 20 years to improve the quality of care for women with obstetric fistulas in African countries. The nature of the injuries is often complex. The social environment in which they occur is often complex. The psychosocial consequences for the women who get these injuries are complex. And so these injuries are best treated at specialist centers that concentrate exclusively or almost exclusively on these kinds of injuries. And there are a number of those that are quite successful in third world countries. I've been involved in creating or supporting several of those. And so one thing you can do is advocate to raise money for such institutions in Africa, which are always face a significant shortfall in the finances they need to do what they're trying to accomplish. Um. At the beginning of your PowerPoint presentation, there was a graph or like an infographic about like where the like um, maternal, maternal yeah, with, between them different um, socioeconomic classes. And in that one, it showed that the lower middle class had more maternal deaths than just low class. Is there a reason for that? Like, well, the reasons for disparities in the graphs are going to have to do with how income levels are determined in various countries and how they how they fit into them and how you collect uh, death certificates uh, and and so on. Um, your risk is certainly incrementally higher as you fall out of higher income into lower income. Uh, classes, but a lot of that can be determined by the structure of the institutions in your particular society. So you may live in sort of a middle income country that, you know, doesn't have the level of uh, education or resources that the United States or, or Sweden has, but if they have a, a policy where they prioritize reproductive health and access to <clears throat> emergency obstetrical services, they, they may do disproportionately well in terms of maternal outcomes just because they're using their resources widely. 
And, and I, would, I would just point out that emergency obstetric care is not enormously expensive. <clears throat> the amounts, the, the things that go into cheap antibiotics, intravenous fluids, uh, medications to prevent seizures that often cost pennies per vial, <clears throat> spinal anesthesia to do a cesarean section costs a few bucks, <clears throat> um, antibiotics, uh, basic, you know, the, these are all relatively low cost interventions that could easily be afforded in health systems around the world if they were effective and functioning and structured appropriately. Well, thank you for your attention. It's a pleasure to be here.